you likely heard the account of Jesus' transfiguration in Sunday school. You just heard it from Anita. So now let me see what I can do with this. I confess to you that through the years I have found it to be a rather intimidating text. Not quite sure exactly what to do with it. But I thought, you know what? I'm going to tackle it this year. So here we go. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And they were coming down from the mountain. And Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. This is the Word of God for me and for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And shall we pray? O oh God, indeed, we give you thanks for these mountaintop experiences. The mountaintop experience of Jesus Himself, of Peter, of James, of John, the mountaintop experiences that we have with you. For them, we are so grateful. And God, I ask that you might encourage us from this text to share our own mountaintop experiences with others, especially perhaps when the need for encouragement is great. And it is in Jesus' name, O oh God, that we offer this in each one of our prayers unto you. Amen. So here is my question about this text. Why does Jesus tell Peter... James and John not to speak of this experience that they just had on the mountain top until after Jesus is raised from the dead. That is the question that the text raises for me. What we have here indeed, as you've heard in Sunday school and as you've heard Anita lead our children, what we have here is the transfiguration of Jesus. So Jesus goes up on a high mountain. The text doesn't identify which mountain. Perhaps it was Mount Tabor. Perhaps it was another mountain. But he goes up and he takes with him Peter, James, and John, Jesus' inner circle from his twelve. And Jesus is transfigured before Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus. And Jesus is transfigured before Peter, 
James, and John. Now, think with me for just a moment about our English word transfigured. That means that Jesus became in appearance, he was transfigured, his figure, his body was changed, it was altered in some way. The Greek word is metamorpho, you hear our word metamorphosis. So, Jesus is on the mount, and he is transfigured. We are told that his face shines like the sun, and we are told that his garments, they become as white as light. And then Moses appears, and Elijah appears, perhaps representing the law and the prophets and Jesus as the ultimate fulfillment of both. So what a mountaintop experience we have here. Perhaps something like what has been all over the news recently that has occurred at Asbury University. My understanding from reading the reports is that at Asbury it is mandatory for students to attend a certain number of chapel services. They have chapel on Wednesday. Most of the time chapel can be rather routine, but not on this particular Wednesday. The students went to chapel at the end, the benediction was given, the gospel choir sang a final chorus, and then people who were in that chapel did not want to leave because they could sense the very presence of God. It was very noticeable. And so my understanding is that even to today, people are continually coming to that chapel, offering praise and worship to God, and experiencing and encountering the presence of God, perhaps like they have not before. It is a mountaintop experience. I've had them. You've had them. And here, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus have a mountaintop experience. Okay. So that's it. Fine. But why does Jesus tell Peter, James, and John not to mention this experience until after Jesus' resurrection? In answer to this question, I pursued two avenues last week. The first thing that I did, and this is good Bible reading, I suggest this to you whenever you are reading your Bible, I read Matthew's account in context. By that I mean I read what comes before the transfiguration and I read what comes after the transfiguration and I was immediately struck by all the talk of suffering and pain that comes before Matthew's account of Jesus' transfiguration. So in Matthew chapter 16, we have Peter's confession of Jesus. Do you remember that? Jesus says to Peter and the disciples, Who do people say that I am? Well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're one of the prophets come back from the dead. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus affirms that response. Next, Jesus predicts his own suffering and death that is about to occur in Jerusalem. And Peter says, oh no, Lord, may that never happen to you. And Jesus says, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You have in mind the interest of man and not the interest of God. And then, listen at what we have in Matthew 16, chapter 24, verse 28. Then Jesus said to his disciples, 
If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The cross, of course, is an instrument of death and suffering. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man or a woman if they gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what will a person give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and will then repay every person according to their deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. So, that is the context that we have. A lot of talk about Jesus suffering, about the disciples' future suffering, about taking up our cross and following Jesus. The second thing that I did last week was I read this same account as it appears in Mark and Luke. So what we have here is a triple tradition. We have an account from the life of Jesus that appears in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You will not find it in John. And here is one of the interesting things about Luke's account. I found him most helpful. Listen to Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 31. Some eight days after these sayings, Jesus took Peter and James and John and went up on the mountain to pray. And while Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him. They were Moses and Elijah, who appearing in glory were speaking of Jesus' departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So Luke tells us, Matthew doesn't, and Mark doesn't, but Luke tells us the topic of conversation between Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, and they are talking about Jesus' departure. They are talking about Jesus' upcoming suffering, His death, and His resurrection. So that really completes the picture, doesn't it? All of this talk of suffering and death, Jesus and that of the disciples in the future, and then Luke tells us that Moses and Elijah and Jesus were speaking of Jesus' upcoming suffering, His departure in Jerusalem. So, we put all this together, and why does Jesus tell Peter, James, and John to tuck this mountaintop experience away for another day? I suggest he says this because the other disciples and followers of Jesus do not yet need to hear of this mountaintop experience. They will later need to hear of this mountaintop experience when the disciples and other followers of Jesus are taking up their cross and their suffering in service to God as Jesus suffered in service to God. Then they will need to hear from Peter, James, and John about this mountain top experience that they had. So, listen again to Matthew 17, 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell this vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Jesus says, Tuck it away and save it for another day. So indeed, most Christians, if we live long enough, 
If we walk with God through Christ long enough, we're going to have some sort of mountaintop experience. We're going to have some sort of experience where God feels particularly close to us. We're going to have some sort of experience where it goes beyond the intellectual and it enters the realm of the experiential, much like the students in the community at Asbury University. We're going to have this encounter with God. Doesn't happen that way every day. Maybe you don't have experiences like that every year. If you did, it would not be called the mountaintop. But hear me, church. Those mountaintop experiences with God are not just for us. They are to be shared with others when needed. Can you imagine Peter, James, and John's contributions to the early Christian community when suffering, when Peter is in jail, when James and John are in jail, when one of them is about to be killed with the sword as the gospel goes out and it's met with opposition? And can you imagine Peter, James, and John saying to their fellow believers in the midst of difficulty, let me tell you about this time when I was on the mountain with Jesus. Let me tell you what I saw. Let me tell you what I experienced. Are you having questions about your faith right now? Are you wondering if it's worth it? Are you wondering if it's true? Are you about to buckle and bend the knee and turn back and go in a different direction? Are you about to give up on Christian faith altogether? But let me tell you about this experience that I had so that it might encourage you. I was on that mountain and Jesus, His garments became white and His face was like light. I could tell that it was Jesus, but He was changed before me in an exalted state. And there was Elijah who went up in the whirlwind. <laughs> I guess he finally came down. I don't know. And there was Moses who wasn't allowed to enter the promised land, if you remember. It was under Joshua that the people entered the promised land. That's always bothered me. After all that Moses did, putting up with all the grumbling of the Israelites. We're hungry, we're thirsty, we want to go back into slavery. And then Moses does something with a rock. We're not sure exactly what the offense was. But then God says, okay, Moses, you can see the promised land, but your feet, they cannot touch the promised land. I've always thought the punishment didn't fit the crime. That has always bothered me. But look here. Moses does get to stick his feet on the promised land, I guess. Right? So there's Moses, and there's Elijah, <laughs> there's Jesus, and Peter, or James, or John. They're telling people about these experiences, and he says, let me tell you about the voice that I heard. The voice said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Yeah. Mountaintop experiences with God are not just for us. They are also for other people. I have um, started, for whatever reason, on Saturdays. Saturday is kind of my Sabbath. I, uh, I sleep in on Saturdays when I can. Uh, I don't shave on Saturdays. <laughs> uh, you know, I go at my own pace on Saturdays when I can. And I started on Saturday mornings reading Augustine's Confessions. You've heard me talk a bit recently about Augustine's Confessions. And I'm about to decide that I need to read him every day. That after I read my Bible, I need to pick up Augustine's Confessions and read him 
every day. Because sometimes it's other people's experience with God that we need. Sometimes our own experience seems rather blah. Sometimes our own experience may seem rather mundane. Sometimes we are thirsting for a mountaintop but it just hasn't come in a long time. And sometimes what we need in our experience with God is an account of somebody else's experience with God to encourage us, to keep us on the straight and narrow. And I find that Augustine's experience with God, of course in addition to my own, but Augustine's experience with God is just what I need on Saturday morning. And so I'm grateful. I'm grateful to Augustine. I'm grateful that he wrote out this big long prayer called the Confessions. I'm grateful that he shared of his own struggles with sexual temptation and with pride and with eating and all of the things that he dealt with. He put it on paper. And I'm grateful that he writes about his experience of God's love and God's forgiveness. It's just what I need on Saturday morning. So I'm grateful that Augustine wrote it down and tucked it away for another day. Amen. Oh,